Nikki Hogarth, and welcome to Southwest Magazine. My guest today is Susan O'Donnell, researcher, writer, and activist, and co-editor of a new book. Susan, can you, well, welcome first to the show. Thank you, Vicki. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Letters from the Future, how New Brunswickers confronted climate change and redefined progress. What's the idea behind it and what's the concept? Oh, well, the idea is that to have a, a future, a sustainable future for New Brunswick, we have to, first of all, imagine what that might look like. Because it's hard to move towards something when you don't really know what you're moving towards. So uh, one of my colleagues on the Raven Project uh, that, I, that I work with um, came up with this idea of why not ask a, a wide range of New Brunswickers to imagine what they would like to see in the future. And so we, we solicited and encouraged people to write articles that were originally published in the New Brunswick Media Co-op. And then we had about 20 of them published. And then Daniel Tubb, who's a professor of anthropology at UNB, who came up with this idea, he said, let's try and get a book together. So we looked at the collection that we had and realized there were a lot of gaps in it, uh, specifically the newcomers, that we needed more voices of newcomers because, of course, they're going to be really important for the future. So most of the new letters that are in this book are from newcomers to New Brunswick. And the idea is, what would you like it to look like? So, for example, I'm really interested in, my, my letter is called Connected Communities, and it's about um, broadband connections. What if we had like fantastic broadband across the whole province and we could all communicate that way? Plus energy issues, so I focused on, on the two things there. And what I would like to see in, you know, 30 years in the future. And other people were looking at governance systems. I mean, when you, when you look at the local government governance issue right now, there's a few articles there about what our governance systems could look like. What would be an ideal governance system? Like um, um, uh, Achi Prado from, he lives in Edmonston, and he Im imagined a governance system that was based on watersheds for example. So you would have an environmental lens on everything you did because you were concerned about the watershed and the environmental mm -hmm. um, boundaries rather than kind of arbitrary physical boundaries that were just kind of made because there might be a community here or a community there. It was all about the way the water flows. So all different ideas and that's what we've collected, Letters from the Future. So we're hoping that people will read this book and think, you know, what what kind of future would I like to see in New Brunswick? And if they're working on those issues, because a lot of the people um, in the book, a lot of the authors are actually working on these issues and working towards these issues. So I think it's kind of helping people just move forward. Mm -hmm. What were some of the letters that were written that were illuminating for you, gave you ideas that maybe you hadn't thought of before? Oh, um, well, one of my co-authors, uh, Abram Lutz, uh, wrote about rural assemblies, for example, which is another governance uh, uh, the idea that you could have people's assemblies that would make big decisions about um, make decisions about the big issues affecting us, and so all the the big decisions wouldn't be made, for example, in um, in the legislature um, or even in Ottawa. That we could get because New Brunswick is a largely rural province, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of and as we've seen in this governance reform piece that's going on right now a lot of people feel really disenfranchised from the political decision making and so Abrams letter was about I think I think he sets it as the third big rural assembly and it happens up in Campbellton and it's this idea of rural people getting together and making decisions for what's best for rural New Brunswick that one that one really inspired me um, there's another one by um, Kylie Bergfock about I live in Fredericton and hers is called gardening on the margins and she talks about um, how there's very few lawns anymore, lawns with grass, that they're all um, basically food gardens. And that a big, a big activity um, is that people get together um, to actually take care of the gardens. And so it becomes not only a, a way of um, having food security and food sovereignty, but also a different way of building community mm -hmm. around common, you know, shared uh, growing food for the community. So those are the kinds of stories that inspired me. It is an interesting time that the book is coming out. You know, when we're looking at municipal reform plans, mm. health reform plans that came out this week, when you realize that 
maybe you should be more actively involved in the conversation and envisioning um, a better future for New Brunswick. Well, that's that's a that's a really great point, Vicky, and I think. Um, that's one of the things that we wanted to show. I mean, really, none of the names in the book, well, there's a few names that people might recognize, but the, the people who wrote are ordinary New Brunswickers. And so I think part of the idea is that, you know, all of us can think about what we might want for the future. And it's not just, um, it's not just the purview of, of, you know, the elected politicians, for example, making decisions about, um, you know, what's going to happen. And that that we that we all have the agency to to think about what our shared future should be, and so many of us, and, and I'm hoping back to your question that it will encourage people to join the many groups across New Brunswick that are working towards these ideas. You mentioned Raven earlier. Yeah. Can you tell people who might not be familiar with it uh, what it stands for, first of all, and sure. what it's about? Yeah, so the Raven Project at the University of New Brunswick, Raven stands for Rural Action and Voices for the Environment. Um, the environment needs a voice. We know that now, and, and we see that really clearly with the climate crisis that's unfolding all around us. There are many, many groups, uh, you know, really wonderful groups across the province uh, in rural New Brunswick working on a range of issues. You know, watershed groups would be the most obvious. Um, but there are, there are, there, there is a need both for support for the groups and working together with them, but, and then there are gaps, uh, you know, groups that are not taking on certain issues that are key environmental issues. So Raven is focused on um, both uh, networking and supporting other rural environmental groups, um, but also speaking out on environmental issues that don't have enough of a, a focus or enough of a lens. And um, we, you know, we've we've kind of moved in in a couple of areas. Uh, the project started in uh, 2018, and it runs for another year, possibly two years. It's a funded research project funded by the, the federal government, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Um, and I'm in the Department of Sociology at the UNB in, in Fredericton, so it's run out of there. So um, a couple of issues that we've really focused on are uh, food sovereignty and food security. Um, and then the other one is energy issues. And specifically, we've, we've uh, focused the last year and a half on uh, the push by the government and the nuclear industry to build new nuclear reactors at Point Le Pro because we, we felt that there, there wasn't enough attention being paid to this issue and we were really concerned with the lack of information that was coming from the government and NB Power, for example, mm -hmm. so we, we put some energy into that one. I know you've produced an award-winning um, film on small yes. nuclear react modular I'm gonna get it wrong it is there are these key it's, words here that we're hearing in New Brunswick I feel I don't know enough about them but I'd love to hear yeah. um, what your video was about and sure. um, and what it illuminated for people well sure the industry calls them small modular nuclear reactors only they aren't that small and they're actually not that modular they are nuclear reactors um, it's actually just a marketing term um, it's, I mean, what they are is proposals for reactors. At the moment, they only exist on paper, and, and uh, some analysts call them PowerPoint reactors because they, they really just, at the moment, it's going to take, well, actually billions of dollars to, to get them to the stage where they might actually be built, and then we don't even know if they're going to work yet. But uh, my main concern um, with the proposal to build them is that, well, first of all, as a researcher, I found it really disconcerting that uh, the, the plans were not peer-reviewed before the funding was announced for any of them. There's no evidence that there's any kind of peer review of these projects, and they're essentially re uh, research projects. And um, I, I find that really disturbing that we've committed so many public funds, so much public funding to, this, to these uh, proposals and to this research without peer review because I have spent the last year and a half reading a lot of peer reviewed research on these proposals and they really don't pass the grade. I think if there had been peer review of these projects, they would not be getting the amount of funding that they have been. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to hear your point of view on, uh, you're an important independent voice, you and everyone at Envy uh, Media Co-op. Um, 
but we do have the highest media concentration of any province mm. in Canada, and, and that can be problematic too for getting uh, perspectives out to the public on, on things like this or glyphosate yeah. spraying. And I'm wondering um, how you think, if, if that's part of the big problem here in New Brunswick, that we do have this high media concentration, that Irving does own most of the papers, oh. especially English language ones. Yeah. Absolutely, and I should have mentioned, Vicki, when you asked me about the Raven Project, that a big part of our focus is getting the word out, because mm -hmm. that's one of the things uh, that we see exactly what you're saying, is that there isn't enough coverage of these issues, certainly environmental issues and also rural issues. And as a matter of fact, our first academic article that was published in the Journal of Rural and Community Studies was an analysis of the coverage of rural issues by uh, actually edit editorials uh, by the Irving Press. So we look back uh, uh, over five years of editorials uh, of the Irving Press, so all, all three dailies, and, and looked at how they were covering rural issues. And what we found is not really a surprise, but it, it just kind of confirmed that um, the vision that is being shaped by the Irving Press is a rural New Brunswick that does not have agency of its own. And, and so stories about um, you know, rural community development and stories about uh, really, really innovative activities are not generally covered or they're covered in a way that, that does not give the kind of weight to rural voices. And mm -hmm. what, what does come across is the idea that rural New Brunswick should really be about supporting big, big industrial projects. And that that is the role of, of rural New Brunswickers, is to support these big industrial projects that are run by outside the communities and that are where the profits are actually enjoyed by people living outside the communities and not about the kind of rural community development that our project Raven, for example, would like to support, where people living in a community have see themselves as having the power to develop you know, their own local economies, for example, or, or having more of a say over where the jobs are, et cetera, et cetera. So we found very much that the view of these big industrial players, which of course Irving is, is the, biggest, the biggest one in the province, was very much the, the tone of all of the rural coverage, that it's about rural people should just be glad for any kind of jobs <laughs> that they have, um, but because it's not going to be about their jobs, and, or it's not going to be about their industries and their views on rural development, it's about what the big players want, and rural people should just kind of suck it up and do it. <laughs> what is your ad advice for a New Brunswicker um, who is trying to get a more well-rounded point of view about what's going on? Because um, I fully, I live in a rural community, um, and I do see that when you do live somewhere like a small town, yeah. uh, the community does. It, it looks out for itself in yeah. these very inspiring ways. Yeah. Um, you don't turn to big business or, or yeah. to the government necessarily to fix something that's wrong. The, the community figures it out and it's always inspiring to me, which is why I like working somewhere independent too, because you can cover those. Yes. No one's telling you, go get a big headline. Yeah. You cover what is important um, to you and your community. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering how you would advise a New Brunswicker who is trying to get a, because it's challenging, you know, yeah. when, especially if maybe you're a newcomer, you don't realize oh, yeah. all the, the majority of the papers are owned by the same yes. company, things like that. Yeah, yes, actually, just on that very last point, I'll just say quickly that um, I was uh, looking at uh, a talk given by Julian Walker recently, who's come out with a, a new book, Critical, of the Irving Press, and he mentioned that for 20 years after the Fredericton Daily Gleaner was bought by the Irvings, it wasn't known that they owned the paper, which, you know, it's that so it's not only like newcomers who don't know the situation, but even, you know, there's a lot of misinformation or a lot of kind of secrecy around it. It's not something that they advertise. Um, what would I advise? I, I would definitely say, you know, look towards independent media and CHCO TV is an obvious one. I mean, we don't have, uh, right now the St. Croix Courier, I believe, is the only independent English language one since the one in Sackville mm -hmm. um, folded earlier this year. Yeah. 
So we really, you know, in Charlotte County, you've got the two best examples <laughs> of that, I would say. And then, of course, I'm very involved in the New Brunswick Media Co-op, um, which is, it's all run by volunteers. Um, and I would absolutely encourage anyone interested in getting their story out to contact the Media Co-op. Most of our stories are, I would consider, as an academic, very, very short, like 800 words, which for me is like, it's really, really hard to, to write something that short. But, um, and there's editors, there's an editorial board. It's, it's all run very democratically, but there's editors who will help people who maybe don't feel all that confident about writing a story if they've never published something before. Um, will help uh, shape the story and, and give advice, etc. So I would absolutely encourage because um, it's it's a it's a great publication. The the online publication nbmediacoop.org is the main venue, and um, I'm not on the editorial board right now. I was for three years. We but I, I write a lot for it. Um, we usually publish between 25 and 40 stories a month. Um, and then there's the um, the brief, which mm -hmm. is the the hard copy publication that did come out ten times a year, but it was cut back during the pandemic to six times a year, and that has about usually four stories of the the best stories of the month or the most interesting stories for whatever reason. Yeah. I should take this opportunity to do a crossover promotion for those of you watching at home. That NB Debrief is a show that CHCO mm -hmm. teams up with uh, the NB Media Co-op. Tobit and Haley uh, is the host of that show and. She did a great episode last week um, during the CUPE strikes. Stephen Dross was one of the guests on that show. It was a half hour focus on yes. um, the strikes. And I know that you've been covering that extensively yes. as a writer. Yes. What's your takeaway from, we're at a point now where oh. there's been 10 locals who've reached yes. a deal. Um, one still, one still not. But yes. what has been? What was it like covering it as a writer? Oh, it was so exciting. <laughs> I, I should say that I worked for uh, more than 13 years for the the um, National Research Council of Canada. That's why I came to New Brunswick. And for my last three years, I was president of the union for all the researchers across Canada, and that's all the N um, National Research Council researchers across Canada, about 1,500 of us, and. That was what really gave me the taste for union issues and how important unions are, especially for doing the big things. You know, a big union like QP has a lot of power to really change not only the narrative, but actually the situation on the ground. So it was, I, I started covering this one back in May when uh, Steve Drost and QP gave the government what they called um, the 100 day notice or 100 day ultimatum till Labor Day. They, they announced it in May, which was 100 days from Labor Day, basically saying on la you know, just after Labor Day, we're gonna take strike votes and then if it's a go, we're gonna go on strike. So that was telegraphed like months ago. And I, it, to me, it's one of the most exciting labor issues to happen in decades, and it's happening right here in New Brunswick. And the reason it is is because the CUPE leadership, Stephen Drost, has said very specifically since the beginning, we're pushing back against austerity, and we're not going to take this anymore. So what he's talking about is that um, austerity governments, of which the Higgs government is like the quintessential one, um, what they do is they manipulate the books to make it look like there's deficits all the time. And, and then what they do is they have a tax regime where the largest corporate players aren't paying their fair share of taxes, if you want to say it that way, and that most of the tax burden is on individual taxpayers. So, I mean, basically what we have in New Brunswick, as in other places that run these austerity governments, is we don't have enough revenue coming in. That's our problem, because if you look at the balance of where the taxes, the tax rate for large corporations, for example, was you know 30, 40 years ago, it's just shifted the other way, and so we do not have enough money coming into the province. And then what happens? And then they say, oh, and we can't afford to pay our public service. We don't have enough money. You know, it's always we don't have enough money. We don't have enough money. And so this is, this is the line that has been taken certainly over the last, um, well, last 15, 20 years in New Brunswick, where the government has been successful at keeping the wages of the public sector well below the cost of living. And so 
Now they're in a situation where a lot of public sector workers have to take two jobs and even three jobs. They're using food banks, not all of them, but, but some of them are. They just can't afford to live on the wages that they're getting. And so when Stephen Drost became president of CUPE New Brunswick, which was only in April, I mean, he was only elected at the AGM in April, which was amazing. He was the first vice president before. And I, kind, I had my eye on him because I knew I'd heard him speak before. And so when he was elected president, I thought, okay, I'm just going to watch this guy. And then sure enough, uh, a month later, he announced this 100-day ultimatum. So he was like focused, right, this is what we're going to do. And they ran a perfect, in my view, a perfect campaign all the way through. And we saw that by the level of public support for the CUPE workers. Like I, um, on Main, Main Street, on Fredericton North, Main Street is the busiest street in the downtown Fredericton area. That's on the north side. Constant stream of cars. And they had a CUPE line there for the duration for the 15 days of the strike. It was just horns blaring all day long, horns of support. There was no question. And then CUPE actually commissioned a survey showing huge support. I think it was 80% or more by the public for the workers. Because these are people, you know, I mean, especially, you know, if you look at schools, which was a huge, uh, you know, that, that was something that affected almost everybody in the province. Either they had children or their neighbors had children or whatever that were affected by the strike. But they knew the bus drivers, and they didn't like to hear that they were being underpaid. You know, they knew the educational support workers, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot of public support. And so I think what QP did and what succeeded, and I'm actually going to do an analysis of this when I get the time, because I, think, I really think it's a huge story that it happened here in New Brunswick, is they pushed back against that successfully. And a lot of people might say, oh, okay, so what they finally got was 2% a year plus 25 cents an hour. Well, you know, that over five years, it, it worked out to mostly, for most people, about 15%. What, what the Higgs government was offering at the beginning was 3, 3%. So that's a huge increase, 3% over four years versus 15% over five years. It's a huge increase. And so it, it's a really, really, really big win for organized labor. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very, very important in the context of, you know, what's happening around the world with austerity governments. It shows that when people get together and they stand in solidarity through their union, they can really make changes. So it's exciting. I'm wondering if you feel this way too. I'm sure you do. Um, when you, working as a journalist in New Brunswick, you realize that it actually doesn't take, you can affect change because you don't need that many people to get on board. Yeah. You know, you can find a grassroots movement and, and change something. And it actually is more interesting than when I was in Toronto. And you could see things took a lot of different things had to get moving before any change could be made. But I do find it interesting oh, yeah. here that it seems to happen quickly if you can create the momentum. I love New Brunswick, I have to say, and that's one of the reasons for it. Like, I'm, I'm originally from Montreal, and I moved to, um, to, to Fredericton from Dublin, Ireland. I lived there for 10 years. I did my PhD there. And uh, it's true, uh, very much what you're saying, Vicki. Uh, you know, like, for example, take the nuclear issue, which I'm kind of known now. I'm, I'm fairly, well, very outspoken on this issue. And, you know, I have uh, gotten coverage on the CBC. I've been interviewed a, few, a, a number of times on it. And, and I've been writing fairly prolifically on it. And then, as you mentioned, that um, video of the presentation I won that, uh, or that I made that won that award. So it is getting recognition. I would say, you know, if I was living in Toronto, I'd be one of many, <laughs> one of many voices talking about this. So it is kind of interesting that, you know, someone's voice, if they take on an issue and, you know, they get their facts together and they want to speak out on it, there's an opportunity to make a difference. And, and I see that right now with, with the nuclear work in particular, but I see New Brunswickers doing that all over, that they have, you have, uh, because it's like a small group of people, um, if you, you know, take a stand and you can make your case, you can make a difference. What do you think are the next big issues that New Brunswick needs to confront? Oh, well, I mean, we definitely need more people coming into the province. Like, I think in the last um, um, census, we were the only province that dropped in population, which is quite worrying. 
um, we, need, we need more people. So we need to find, and the only way, well, I suppose that could happen with inward um, migration from other provinces. And actually, I, I wouldn't be surprised, I'll just say quickly that, you know, with what's happening in the interior of BC right mm -hmm. now, if there's another few summers of this, fires and then floods, I think people, as much as they wouldn't like to uproot from, you know, what they would consider formerly as kind of a paradise situation, but would be looking east for sure. So we, we probably will be having more um, inward migration from other mm -hmm. provinces, but we've got to be taking on uh, more people from other countries. Like there's, there's going to be a lot of climate refugees, unfortunately. And we have to think about the responsibility that we've had in creating the climate crisis. Like Canada is still one of the per capita worst emitters of greenhouse gas. And we like to think of ourselves as not that way, but we are. And so we bear, uh, even though, you know, we've only, you know, 35 or however, 36 million people compared to the U.S. that has, you know, 10 times that. Per capita, we, we bear a responsibility for the climate mess that we find ourselves in now. And so, yeah, there's climate refugees happening all across. There's famines in different countries that are caused by climate. There's, you know, there's floods. There's people being uprooted. And so I think we have to be doing more to bring in more newcomers and make sure that they settle okay in New Brunswick. There's so many opportunities here and so many people with, you know, wonderful skills who can contribute to our economy and society. If, if we can find a way to get people here and help them stay here. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Susan. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks so much, Vicki, for having me. My guest today has been Susan O'Donnell, writer, activist, and researcher. I'm Vicki Hogarth. Thank you for watching Southwest Magazine.